So let me introduce myself first. I am uh, uh, Maharishma Arujanan. I'm the global coordinator of ISA, which is the international service for the acquisition of agri-biotech applications. And I'm also the co-founder of SMC Malaysia, which is Science Media Center Malaysia, which was founded just a month ago on 1st April. And um, my co-founder is also with us today, Tan Su Lin. She's helping me organize this uh, web, uh, webinar. And um, we founded this um, SMC Science Media Center Malaysia, emulating SMC UK. Uh, it's a virtual uh, portal where we want to link media and scientists together so that evidence-based uh, information gets out to the public, especially so during a pandemic like this. And we will also continue working beyond the pandemic, pandemic because science information is always very, very important for the public and all other stakeholders. So again, welcome to the webinar. Today we are going to discuss um, how COVID-19 is going to affect or is already affecting food security or food systems. Now with me is Professor Paul Ting. Uh, he is the adjunct senior fellow of food security at Rajaratnam School of International Studies, uh, Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. And then we have Dr. Shafiq Siddiq, who is the director for the Institute of Agricultural and Food Policies Studies from University Putra, Malaysia, and Shaolin Lo, design director at Eats, Roots and Shoots. Now, before we start, I would like to um, announce again that um, while many of you are on the Zoom, uh, others could also join us live on Facebook on Science Media Center Malaysia and also UPM Facebook. We are also live on ISA Facebook, uh, isaa.org. So again, for everyone with us, thank you very much. So what I'm going to do is let's have um, sort of a semi-informal or just informal discussion today. Uh, what um, we will be doing is I will just give a very short intro on food security, food systems. And then um, I will move on to um, our panelists and ask them to give their perspective on food security. So let me start off. Now, um, the truth is there was already a dire global food uh, and nutrient insecurity even before the pandemic. We have so much of challenges like um, climate change uh, and also natural disasters and many other things. Now we have got like a double whammy, um, existing challenges and the pandemic. So the pandemic is now testing our food and agricultural system. On one hand, we all go to the supermarket. We still see grains, fruits, vegetables, and all other food. On the other hand, um, although this, the prices have increased for many items, now on the other hand, uh, we also hear about countries uh, stocking up, banning export, and there is panic buying among uh, a lot of the public, food waste, wastage, farmers dumping their produce due to broken food supply. So there is a multitude of factors in play in our food um, system uh, during a crisis. How can technologies help? How can sound policies help? Digital platform help? We know digital platform is already kicking in. So this is what going, we are going to discuss among many other things. Now, before we start, I would like to ask my um, co-founder of Science Media Center, uh, Sulin, to launch a poll, a simple poll. Yes, so if all of you could just answer this simple poll, what is your understanding about food security? Now the word food, food security is like a buzzword, it's being used so much. Food security or food insecurity, now what does it mean? We've got availability, meaning is food available when you want it? Now then, Accessibility, these are two different things because available is, it might be available in my city, but then it might not be available in some remote areas. Affordability, it might be available in my city, but I don't have enough money because it's too expensive to buy, so that's affordability. There might be a lot of food, but are they nutritional? And then again, there might be food, but what are the safety, um, are they safe enough? Meaning, are they contamination? Um, is the food, um, free of um, anti-nutrients and many other food safety issues, toxic and things like that. Oh, that was fast, thank you very much. So we have availability, 44%. Um, now I see that um, a number of you might have also responded to all. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to close this poll. I'm not going to give the answer. We have got a food security expert 
So I'm going to ask Professor Paul Ting uh, to answer us. Maybe you can define food security first and then give us your perspective of food security. I mean, that's definition as well. Go on, Prof. Prof, can you unmute? Sorry. Uh, I, I am. Yeah, you, now we hear you. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah. I think in today's understanding of food security, it includes all of those. Yeah, I think if we go back, you know, 30, 40 years, the main concern and understanding of food security was making sure that food was available. But today is so different, really. I think people not just want to have food, access to it, affordable food, but also food that's nutritious, safe. And we all have our different standards. And in fact, there's even an additional criterion, which is that the food should be sustainably produced. Uh, so I think, the, to me, the correct answer is that all of the above, basically. And I'll stop there, Maha. OK. Now, um, Dr. Shafiq, I'm going to go to you now. You are involved in um, policies in Malaysia, and now you've got uh, a meeting. You're on standby, meet, uh, uh, waiting to meet the minister. Uh, I know you might have to leave early, but can you give us, since you're you are an economist, you're working on policies, can you give us your perspective of hey. security? Can you uh, repeat that question? I was cut off a bit just now. Sorry. Okay. Now, I was saying that you are involved uh, in policies and you, you are working with the minister right now for Malaysian uh, policies on food security and you are an economist. So, can you give us your perspective coming from non-science? Can you give us, you know, uh, your perspective, how economy policies and every other things play uh, a role? Now, food security is multidimensional. I have to agree with Professor Paul. Uh, it's not just about uh, your ability to produce as a country, yeah, but also making sure that the food is available to everyone. Uh, not only food, if you are in the uh, middle income, high income country, you are also talking about uh, a myriad of, uh, you know, a range of different food, nutritious food, and, uh, and they are all accessible. I think... I think this is what food security uh, today is uh, is really about. It's not just uh, availability, but affordability. Um, you have uh, choices, and uh, you are presented with uh, uh, not only just uh, normal choices, but also nutritious uh, food. Okay, thank you, thank you, Dr. Shaufik. Um, Shaolin, now you are involved with the urban farming, so it's more public centric, what people can do. So can you give us your perspective, how maybe, what do you do first, urban farm, what is urban farming? And also how public can play a role? Okay, so I think for our part, for Eat Shoots and Roots, we've been around for eight years now. And when we started, we actually started as a grassroots organization and we were a small team and we just basically wanted to be secure about our own food production and we wanted to learn more about how we can produce our own food. Um, and then in the process, we've helped other people do it as well. Um, but over the eight years, then you start to realize also that um, urban farming is very alluring, but it may not have enough space to grow all the food that we need in the city. So um, I think it's really important to work with local farmers as well. Um, to make sure that there's a symbiotic relationship because it's not just about city folks um, growing their own veggies and that will make us um, food secure in that sense. It's not enough and we don't have enough space and not everyone has the time also. So I think it's a, it's a working together with existing farmers and our role is actually more of educating the public on um, how to appreciate the food that's grown, how hard it is to grow it um, so they can try at home as well and at least they have appreciation towards it. And I think, I feel that if there were more young people going into farming as well, um, maybe this is the right time. Because previously, before MCO, we've always found it hard to convince uh, younger people to get into farming. Just because of the economics at play, the numbers, it just, it's a lot of work for very little return financially. So I think that's something that, if that can be addressed in new policies in government, that would be great to encourage the younger people. Well, I think under the new normals, um, a lot more people will be looking for other ventures uh, to uh, have a secured income. Now, um, I must apologize that I did not introduce the other two panelists. The Shaufi today um, is the Director of Institute of Agricultural and Food Policy Studies, UPM, and Shaolin Lau, I think I did, right? Design Director at uh, Roots and Shoes. I think I did, okay. 
Now, so with that introduction, um, let me go uh, to some of the questions that um, I've prepared, and then we will also try to weave in with um, a lot of questions that participants are already um, provide, uh, posing. So one is how does the pandemic, we've talked, we, have, we spoke about what is food security. Now, how does the pandemic affect food systems or food securities or far, and also farmers' livelihood? Um, so I will ask um, Prof. Paul to address this first. I think as far as food systems are concerned, again, in today's context, you know, we look at food systems as stretching all the way from production to the consumer, through different steps or phases, as we call it now, in the production, the harvesting, processing, transport, and so on. Now, I think right now we're seeing that the main effect that the pandemic is having is because of the measures we're taking to try and reduce the spread of the virus. So this means movement control, lockdowns, and so on. And this really has resulted in delays in, in produce getting from the farm to the market, you know, temporary shortages, uh, no labor for harvesting or handling of food, and even farmers not finding labor to plant the next crop. Okay? So that's where the food system part is concerned. Now, farmers themselves are really affected in, in a very big way. I think we hear all those stories of farmers, you know, having to feed their produce to cattle to other kinds of livestock because they can't get their produce shipped to the market, which is really very sad. Huh? It's a labor shortage, loss of income. But something we must forget too is that, you know, all this goes together into the food security picture. Okay? I think in a sense, almost every dimension of food security is affected. And the longer this pandemic drags on, I think the more severe will be the effects on all the dimensions of food security. I, I want to take this opportunity to also mention something. Okay? Food security also includes nutrition security. And right now, I'm particularly concerned in monitoring, you know, nutrition security, especially among the young, the elderly, and also pregnant women, because we all know that children in particular are really affected by nutrition security, right? And linked to that too is the fact, you know, that movement control is having an impact on employment, employability. You know, you've got thousands of daily wage workers who can't work, and as a result of which they have no money to really buy food. So ultimately, their nutrition is affected, not just the amount, but the diet composition is really affected. So that will be my, my kind of short answer to your question, Maha. Okay, thank you, um, Dr. Ting. Uh, Shaolin, could you tell us, you mentioned that you are working with farmers uh, and also the public. So could you mention uh, before, pre-pandemic and uh, post, uh, now during pandemic, what is happening? Um, in terms of farmers, how we work with farmers, we won't, don't work directly with them. We try to support them where we can. So we encourage uh, people that we deal with, communities that we deal with to buy from the farmers. Um, and we kind of support and promote um, purchasing from organic farmers spe specifically. So we try to support that. Um, but on our part, it's mainly what has happened before. Well, before um, this MCO, we would have a few projects. Um, there's one urban farm that's based in YWCA in KL and that is working with a group of underprivileged women who are learning about culinary arts. They're, they're, they're basically in a vocational training school and the garden there is to supplement their training in hopes that they will learn more about their produce and then they can process it better. Um, but then obviously since then we haven't been able to manage that garden as well. But we've seen a lot of interest um, with people starting to look into edible gardening. So we have an online shop and we already had it before this, but suddenly during the MCO, um, there's been a surge of people coming to our shop or online la, and, uh, to purchase things. So it's encouraging to see that people are starting to see how important it is to know and understand how their food grows. And a lot of parents are looking to educate their kids on it as well. Whereas before this, people would see farming or growing vegetables as like a very old person thing, something senior citizens do. Um, but yeah, you can see a lot more younger people getting into it. Okay, that, that's good. Now, to the participants who are with us, uh, you may post your questions at the box, at the Q&A box uh, below. So I'm going to uh, go on to the next question now. Um, the thing is, I also see Dr. Shaofeik has to leave because 
he was actually on standby today. Um, just uh, all of a sudden, uh, the, uh, the minister is having a meeting. So let's see if he comes back. If not, we certainly have Dr. Ting, who's the authority on food security. So, uh, from for Ting, I want you to start off um, again with, um, with my second question. Were we prepared, um, not just the pandemic, but are we prepared, whether it's pandemic or whether it's a crisis, are we pre uh, were we prepared for any uh, uh, crisis? And what do we do to create a more resilient agriculture system uh, to crisis proof our agriculture system? How can technology and innovation help? So a few questions there, if you can address them. <laughs> well, you know, I think it's difficult for any country to say that they're truly prepared. Okay? I think every country has its own direction in terms of food security. You know, I know some countries want to be 100% self-sufficient, others no, and for very good reasons. In the case of rice, you know, it really doesn't make a lot of sense to be 100% self-sufficient, okay, because there's no competitive advantage. You know, I mean, the Philippines is a good example, you know, when the president came on board, he wanted to be 100%. But when you look at the cost of production of rice, it was three or four times more expensive in the Philippines compared to Vietnam and Thailand. Okay. So in that sense, you can say that, hey, maybe the Philippines is not so well prepared, right? But certainly, I think there are some things we can do, and this is where putting in planning is so important. I think, I think Dr. Shawford, you know, is going for a meeting. Malaysia is going to set up a food security committee. And I just want to mention in Singapore, you know, since the 0708, the 2011 crisis, we actually have a, had an inter-ministry committee on food security, cutting across all government departments that are even peripherally involved in food, food security, trade industry, manpower, agriculture, and so on. And I want to mention, it's, it's actually a big mistake to locate food security in the agriculture department alone. Yeah, because food security is more than that. Yeah, it, it takes a, what we call a whole of system approach. Now in terms of, you know, I mean, one of the terms that you had used earlier was how do you actually in fact, have a more resilient agriculture, yeah, the crisis proof things. I think there are some things that can be done as a direct response to any disruption, whether it's a pandemic or some other disruption. One is to, you know, as a, at the policy level, make sure that agriculture is given priority. Agriculture, in fact, is allowed to continue, right? And we saw this last few weeks, you know, that early in the, in the pandemic, agriculture wasn't treated as an essential service. Right? As things dragged on, we all started to recognize that, hey, if you stop people involved in agriculture, you're going to suffer disruptions to your food supply. So countries like India, China started changing okay, and designated agriculture workers as essential workers. The other thing I think that's important too is, is the think food systems. You don't just think of the farmer. They have think food systems, the entire supply chain. We've got to somehow protect the integrity of this entire supply chain. It doesn't matter whether your supply chain is long or short. You know, even with short supply chains within the own country, you still have to protect the integrity of the supply chain. Because anytime you disrupt that, you interrupt the supply of food. In the end, consumers don't get the food. Now, I also think that even in terms of technology, there are some things we can do nowadays. We talk a lot about the fourth industrial revolution, the fifth IR and so on, you know. So there are some parts of the food system which lend themselves you know, to, to basically four IR and five IR technologies. We're just starting to practice those in Southeast Asia. And I think we can in fact apply a lot more. And, and in this context, I include urban farming. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, surprisingly, you know, I mean, right now, according to the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization, Urban farming, in fact, supplies about 20% of the world's food. Okay, so it's not a unique in some sense. What is unique is that we are now able to increase both labor productivity, space productivity. Okay, in other words, going vertical farming, for example, yeah, controlling the environment, yeah, in other words, buffering against climate change. So a lot of things that we can do, mechanical technologies, digital technologies, even biological technologies, like biotechnology, for example. Okay, so yeah, in fact, it really depends on each country how prepared each can be or want to be for that matter. Of course, you know, there's, there's nothing like a good crisis like COVID-19, right, to shake governments up. In fact, I was on another interview the other day and I kind of said rather facetiously actually that COVID-19 has done a lot more to create awareness of the importance of food security than all the papers I've written or my colleagues have written. Yeah. So this is a very good time for us to really impress on those are responsible to say that, hey, look, food security is totally essential for national security. 
Okay, we could make sure we protect the security. Otherwise, we're all in trouble. Okay. Thanks, Ma. Yeah, thanks. I think um, COVID-19 not only created awareness on food uh, security, it also created awareness on science and the importance of scientists. Mm -hmm. Scientists were never put on pedestal until now. Now everyone is looking for scientists for a solution. So, yeah. you know, the silver lining in the crisis. Uh, tying up with what um, Prof Teng was saying, I want to turn to Shaolin and ask you, you know, we always, uh, this is another buzzword, urban farming, vertical farming, but let's decipher that a little bit. What does urban farming really mean? What can we do in the pretext of urban farming? And also one quick number one question for Shaolin is, do you think, uh, this is this question is coming from um, one of the participants. Do you see farming or um, being introduced as part of education? Maybe Sha Shaolin, you could uh, respond to that. Yeah, so the first thing actually for us, we are more focused on edible gardening rather than urban farming because Edible Garden is um, smaller, it's in a smaller space. We target homeowners, um, whereas if you wanted to start an urban farm, it would take a different kind of resource. It would take uh, a lot more financial capital and then the manpower as well. So we haven't really found a farming model with a community that wanted to partake in it at the same time um, because of time constraints and money constraints. So for us, we are mainly focused on edible gardening. Um, so we help um, families start gardens at home, um, small scale, just to get no, their no, kids I'm growing. I'm going to stop you uh, for a minute. Now, when you say edible gardening, what does it mean? Because when, when you know, when I want to do gardening and it's meant for uh, eating, it's all edible. So what do you mean by edible gardening? So you're not talking about flowering and horticulture, right? That's what you mean by edible gardening. Yeah, so I think in plants, there's usually either people grow an ornamental garden or an edible garden. So an ornamental garden requires less labor, less work because the plants can thrive easier. They don't need so much love and care. But then when you're doing edible gardening and you're growing veggies, and you're growing things that you need to harvest and you need to make sure that you have enough of it to, to harvest later on, um, yeah. there's a lot more labor involved, a lot more fertilization, capital is higher. La. So that's the difference between um, and gardening and, and ornamental, yeah, uh, yeah ornamental okay. gardening. Um, yeah, so I mean, mainly we are focused on edible gardening and we help families do that. Um, in terms of getting schools more into edible gardening or at least mm -hmm. agriculture, la, we've tried before. Um, we've been approached by quite a few schools and we have also approached schools, but usually the problem is that the teachers don't have time. Um, to teach their kids, uh, teach the kids a dedicated session on gardening because it's not in the main curriculum. Um, it's always considered like an extra society uh, activity, that kind of thing. So what I feel is that it needs to be something that is part of the main syllabus so that every child at least has the basic knowledge of how to grow or how, how food grows. Um, I think that's a good survival skill to have, I mean very basic right and um, so if on a government level or a lobbying level that could be done and brought in again that would really I think help build yep. next the next generation of farmers in that sense. yeah sure because a lot of um, children these days they think food is um, uh, food comes from Tesco or from hypermarts now there is a question here which I think also uh, ties up with what I wanted to ask uh, this is Dr. Margaret Karembu, our good friend from uh, Kenya. Now, uh, that ties up with um, Sharizal Dengi's uh, question. Now, you see, we, uh, what, they, what they are saying, we have made, um, the government in many countries have made uh, makeshift hospitals and uh, additional support, uh, healthcare support. But then, how come our food sector did not move on to develop temporary uh, cold storage with, uh, within farmers' reach? agro-processing uh, plants to secure, uh, produce a post-pandemic. Now, um, that's what Sharizal is also asking about, uh, saying that the biggest challenge is to maintain the lifespan of our vegetables or any other uh, produce, perishable produce. So this was not done. How can we address this now? And were there any problems that this was not seen before? Nothing? Well, that's, that's, uh, yeah, that's more for... Thing, right? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's actually quite a tough question to, you know, yeah. to answer because, as you know, while most food is produced in the countryside, most of the demand is in the cities. Okay? 
and there are economic financial reasons why a lot of companies in food processing don't locate their facilities in the countryside, even though that's where the source you know, of most of the food is. So, you know, one of my, my recent papers that I wrote, I actually suggested that if you take the case of India, you know, where many of the daily wage workers in the cities went back to the countryside, you know, one solution actually, in fact, is to have more enterprises in the countryside that you can actually process food. But this requires investment, okay? And there's been no, I would say, track record of co-locating, you know, many of these food processing facilities in the countryside. Thailand tried to do that years ago with, you know, with the kind of one product per village, you know, policy that the late king had. In fact, there were NGOs in Thailand, yeah. you know, like PDA, they tried to create localized processing facilities yeah, to, to get, create employment for those in the countryside and so on. But, you know, again, like I said, I think COVID-19 is probably a good catalyst for us to start rethinking our food systems. Okay? One of which is to shorten our supply chains and also to get, you know, young folks to actually stay in the countryside. Yeah. You know, and, and help farmers to also, you know, increase and improve their livelihood. And one, one way to do that is value add. Okay? Because right now, most farmers, when they sell the raw produce, they're not the ones deriving the most value. It's usually the middle persons, the processors, they have the most value addition. So, so, yeah, so I think it's part of a whole, you know, gamut of rethinking our food systems yeah, and also creating employment, attracting young people back. And this addresses some very big issues. I mean, we all know farmers are getting older, you know, the countryside, the city migration is there, you know, and so on, actually. So, yeah, you know, but, but then it also boils down to, you know, the, the kind of policy questions, you know, I mean, governments need to prioritize, right? Because in the end, you know, even though we all believe that food is so important, but as an economic activity, you know, agriculture has never been able to compete, you know, with, let's say, manufacturing computer chips, you know, services and so on. Which is why most governments tend to go for the economic activities that tend to create much higher value, right? Now, hopefully we will uh, have changed our way of thinking now and, uh, and start addressing some of these weaknesses in the system. Uh, yeah. yeah. So basically, if we try to, if we um, empower local communities to get into uh, agriculture, value add within the local community or rural areas, and then we are going to solve a lot of problems, social economic problems, and also the supply chain problems. So uh, now the other question here is, how can technology? Prop, you in the earlier uh, your beginning in the beginning of the session, you mentioned technology. Now, can you? dissect a little bit more. What are the technologies? We're talking about IoT, we're talking about precision agriculture, um, including urban and vertical farming. What are the other technologies that can help? And this is not just um, technologies in biology, but also you know, everything coming together with IT and uh, many other things, engineering. So could you elaborate on that? Sure. You know, there are some old fashioned technologies which still have not been widely adopted. Okay mechanization, fertilization, even seeds, you know, where we can still make a big impact in the countryside, okay, by making sure that farmers have access, okay, to these so-called technologies huh, from the first green revolution. Now, in today's world, we tend to talk a lot about so-called disruptive technologies, okay, and basically, you know, I, I tend to divide this in, in several categories, okay, the digital technologies that we talk so much about, Internet of Things, the Internet of Everything, you know, and, and so on, really sensors, you know, intelligent sensors, and so on and so forth. Huh? Then there's mechanical technologies, okay, the robotics, you know, the machinery, which are applicable both in the countryside and also in the cities. And the third set are, are the biological technologies. Okay? And, and, and really, biological technologies lend themselves so much to science. Yeah, okay? I mean, all the big discoveries you know, in biology, molecular biology, you know, and other aspects of biology, even ecosystem biology, yeah, that can really be put to play to help us improve production systems, okay? Now, if you want to be very specific, you know, and I, I don't pretend here to be bashful about it, you think biotechnology, okay? Whether we agree or disagree with it, biotech crops have played such a big role in ensuring that we've got surplus food. You know, if you look at the countries from which we import Asia, right? soybeans and corn. It's all those countries from the West that have adopted biotechnology, right? 75% of the world's soybeans come to Asia. Most of it comes from the Western hemisphere. Okay, basically North, South America, 
you know, the ones, you know. And now we've got this whole area of gene editing, which are producing new varieties. Now, somebody asked, I think you, you mentioned the question about, you know, perishables, vegetables and fruits, right? Now we now have the technologies that actually delay senescence. That's been around for many years now. It used to be GM, but it doesn't have to be anymore. Just imagine if you can, in fact, delay senescence of fresh vegetables and fruits, you would have done a lot to reduce wastage. And also to help farmers ensure that their produce get the market in a good condition, right? But all these require investments, basically. And, and I'm really sad to say that, you know, in all the studies that I've done, agriculture research and development generally receives among the lowest of investments from the public sector, unfortunately. Okay? Mm -hmm. We've got to change that. We really have to change that. If we don't change that, then the private sector takes over. Okay? And when the private sector takes over, we all complain. <laughs> that, you know, there's a monopoly and so on, you know? So it's a chicken egg situation, yeah? So, so if I uh, say, you know, in, in policy making at the regional level, I would actually urge governments, look, it's time to invest a lot more in agriculture research and development that empowers your own farmers. Because by empowering farmers to produce more, you also empower your consumers and all the way down the supply chain, okay? Upstream, downstream, yeah? So investments are very key indeed. And, and today really there's so much technology available, okay? And even, even in a country like Singapore, you know, that doesn't have much farming, okay, the number of ag tech companies is incredible, agriculture technology companies. And they are now combining with ag tech, with food tech, and with fintech, financial technology, okay, which are technologies that enable small farmers, for example, to get on their mobile phone, access market information, access to advisory information. It's not just here in Africa, you also see that. You know, MasterCard, for example, has invested in some tremendous software in Africa that allows the smallest of the small farmers to access advisory information. Philippines, Thailand, India, this, this is all happening. But we've got to mainstream all of this. Okay? Yeah. And, and, and it's all then aimed towards uplifting farmers' livelihoods. Okay? Because unless farmers' livelihoods are improved, they're not going to stay on the land. And their children are not going to stay on the land. Okay? So, so they're all linked together, all these issues. But we also have many critics for uh, on agri uh, biotechnology, and this is what ISA does. So uh, ISA actually facilitates the adoption and approval of biotech crops, and also the, um, the newer technologies like gene editing and um, like what Prof. Uh, Paul thinks it. These are very very important because they offer solutions together with the conventional technologies. And we have our colleagues uh, from around the, um, the world, um, Prof. Kausa Malik from uh, pa Pakistan Biotech Information Center. Dr. Um, Margaret Karembu and also uh, our staff from the Philippines office. Now, um, Professor Kausa Malik says here, what you do Shaolin is called kitchen gardening in Pakistan. So you know some what we can do as public, what we can do. Now, I want to ask you a question Shaolin on urban farming. How much support do you get from the government? Uh, if you're getting any, if you're not, what support do you think will facilitate this further or encourage people to at least grow something uh, like what Kausal, the Professor Kausal said, at least in the back, backyard behind in the kitchen. Okay, so when, when we started, we were a group of um, three people. We did it purely based on our own capital. We didn't get any funding from government at that time. Uh, what we started was with was bringing in teachers to come and teach us about uh, permaculture agriculture, how to implement it in Malaysia. And since then, I think in terms of government um, subsidies and stuff like that, we're not really in the agriculture sector. We're not really in specifically in urban agriculture either. We are a bit of a niche social enterprise in that sense because we are more on edible gardening. It's not specifically commercial growing. So we have not received or applied for uh, government grants, um, but we did get uh, an investment from a youth trust foundation, which is, I guess, also government linked in that sense, which has enabled us to continue our business, to develop it further, um, to you know come up with different packages for people to start in their own gardens, and also enable us to um, continue our services and offering it. And I think with that, that has enabled us to last for the past eight years. Um, so I guess we've been lucky in that sense. Um, but yeah, I think, I think these days there are a few more agriculture grants, 
But some of my farmer friends, they have applied, but they didn't get it. So then they were a bit disheartened. I think the criteria was not very clear, or maybe there were some corrupt practices along the way that you know kind of affected the application process. So that I mean that that's reality lah. That's what happened to a farmer friend of mine who's a young guy who wants to who wanted to expand his farm, um, and he wanted to apply for grant and he didn't get it. But then his other friend got it and bought a watch instead or something like that lah. You know something. Not very fair in the system. Okay. So okay, so we yeah. still need a little bit of cleaning up there. Um, yeah. So for uh, for those who are still joining us, thank you very much for staying on, and we still have time. So please, um, you if you have any questions, um, post it on the Q and A uh, box below your screen. I want to um, move on and ask a question which was posed by Sheila Kailin, and now she's asking ecosystem based mitigation approach now i think prof you mentioned this earlier in discussion can you uh, tell us um, how that works and especially in a coastal community or at least just tell us what is ecosystem based mitigation or ecosystem approach <laughs> you know that that question is a very deep one okay? there's no single ecosystem approach okay, to ensuring you know sustainable systems or food security there are many, many different kinds of approaches. Basically, it means trying to utilize your ecosystem services, your ecosystem landscape to the extent you, that you can, okay, utilize natural resources okay, as much as you can to, to basically you know, design and implement sustainable systems. Usually it happens within the community. You know, when I used to be at the World Fish Center, we talked a lot about coastal community systems, okay, where they talk about common property resources, you know, people sharing the same common property, which is in this case, coastal waters, yeah, getting together to safeguard, you know, the fisheries, for example, okay, making sure that there's no dynamite fishing, there's no poisoning and so on. Also including uh, ecotourism in that respect. So ecosystem approaches really require a multi-pronged approach, okay. I mean, the word ecosystem, as it implies, you know, consists of people, physical environment, the bio environment. Okay, so to the extent that you can, you tap all the resources to come up with the best solutions, not a single solution. Okay, because I think ecosystem approaches tend to avoid what we call the silver bullet approach, okay, to solving problems. Yeah. Now that this is a very short answer to your question. In fact, that topic itself could justify a whole afternoon of discussion. Uh, I mean, there, there are many, many examples of technologies that are ecosystem based. Now, the one that I can think of very, very you know clearly is uh, in Vietnam, for example. In rice ecosystems, they've got something called ecological engineering, okay, which to me is one of the best ecosystem approaches to pest management. Okay. It's still spraying uh, pesticides on the rice crops. They believe in the harmony okay, between the predators, parasites, and the pests in the rice fields. So what they do is they plant on the rice buns, refugia plants, which allow spiders, aphids, you know, to actually grow before the pests come on and the rice plant goes up. Okay? And if you don't spray, then it's incredible. This balance between the predator and pest and basically the parasites yeah, becomes very harmonious. Basically, the more pests you have, the more food for the predators and the parasites. This has been uh, proven many times over as one example of a specific technology called ecological engineering that is to me part of the ecosystem approach. Okay? I'll stop there, Mark, because there's a lot that yeah, can be said. Yeah. I, think, yeah. I think you have at least made people understand what is eco um, ecosystem based approach, which really makes sense because we, you know agriculture itself, uh, there are so many uh, players, biotech and non biotech, and so many other things. So especially when it comes to ecosystem, how everything we can actually leverage everything to give give us what we want in agriculture. Now, there's also another question from uh, this is another question from Mizan Yahya. He's asking, is there is the solution different for urban, rural, and island and island settings? So maybe urban is like what Shaolin is doing, at least producing something, not probably in a large scale, but some sort of like prof, you said 20% is actually um, coming from urban uh, farming. So yeah. how how can we address this? A different solution for different settings. Do you want me to go first? Yes, please, bro. Okay. 
Well, I think they're very distinctive differences. I'm actually finishing a paper right now called Small Island Agriculture, okay, which is very different from large country agriculture. Okay? Small island states like Singapore, for example, you know, is basically an urban city state. Okay? Now, as uh, Sheldon pointed out, you know, space is limited, water is limited, labor is limited for farming. So what you do is you then gravitate towards farming systems that tap those weaknesses as strengths. Okay, the typical you know, kind of Chinese thing, you know, about crisis and opportunity. Okay, now for countries that have large, you know, country sites, you can grow extensive crops like rice, you know, soybean, and so on. Small island states or cities, for that matter, you can't grow extensive crops. You can go for intensification. So vegetables lend themselves. And I think we'll be kidding ourselves to think that, for example, cities, urban farming can totally supply all the food needs. That's not going to happen at all. Okay? Mm. And most small island states recognize that, which is why if you go to the next level up, you know, it's a shame Tokyo Shafiq is not here. Yeah. You know, FAO was preaching, you know, the difference between self-sufficiency and what they call self-reliance as an approach towards food security. Now, Singapore, as an example, adopts a self-reliance approach. What that means is that you produce as much as you can, okay? you then generate the means to import from other countries. And in this case, you know, your household revenue, household income is a very key factor here. Okay? There's lots of data that, that goes to show you know, that the, uh, the richer households are, the more food secure they are. Okay, and the more diverse their diet is. In fact, there's a lot of good data to, sh to show that, you know. So back to the contrast between rural and urban farming. Rural farming tends to concern on extensive crops. Okay? But countryside farming or rural farming is still the basis for most of our staples. Although I suspect that might be changing. Okay? Now, rural agriculture, in fact, if I can just pick on what Sheldon said, you know, it's like, give you an example of Singapore, you know, apart from the formal urban farming. There's also a lot of informal urban farming. I think, uh, was it, uh, was it Mali who mentioned kitchen farming? See, in Singapore, we have a lot of community gardens. There's several hundred of them. Okay? And these are plots of land that are dedicated to hobby farmers. Okay? They're either retirees or people who love, love gardening. And they actually replace the need to import more vegetables or to grow more vegetables from the formal sector. Okay. Now, right now, as you know, because of COVID-19, you know, the Singapore government's, you know, tried to accelerate its efforts to produce more food. Okay. And my recommendation to them is that you can look at three pockets of food production in cities. And this applies to almost every, every city. One is the formal farming, where you've got, you know, the conventional farms, vegetable farms, organic, inorganic, and so on, which farm under open air, there could be shade, Okay, so you farm the usual green vegetables and so on. That in Singapore is still the main source okay, of vegetables in, in the island state. There's a second category of, of produce. Increasingly, these are the controlled environment farms. Okay? The modern term is they are PFELs, plant factories with artificial light. Okay, there are over 450 of these in Asia now. Even in Singapore, we've got five or six of them now. In fact, Malacca, there's some companies in Malacca that are quite pioneering in this aspect together with Marty, actually. This is where you grow vegetables in an enclosed environment, modify the light, the temperature, and also the CO2 content, where you speed up growth and you grow vegetables in, in layers, in tiers. So your productivity is five or 10 times what it is in one horizontal level. The investment is very high, unfortunately. Okay? Uh, but it more than pays for itself, especially in times of crisis, to ensure that you have a buffering effect. Linked to that, you know, is also now what we call uh, some of the more future food, okay? Like plant-based proteins, algae, uh, insects, you know, mushrooms and so on. And, and this is going to be the third pocket that's going to get more and more important in, in, in controlled environments and also in city states, yeah? In fact, I see, you know, when I, when I travel around Asia, there are more and more of these kind of facilities within cities, okay, producing alternative food. Okay? They're not, not ever going to truly replace the staples. That's not possible at all. But they certainly supplement and they complement our, our diet, which is so important. And this goes back to the nutrition security. Yeah? So yes, short answer, there are differences between urban and rural farming. Okay? 
urban farming is very much premised on working with the limitations, land, space, you know, water and labor. Okay, but technology allows us to do that. Okay, the, 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 in fact, the biggest issue now is public acceptance, public acceptance of novel food. Okay, like one of my students did a survey recently, and she found that there was a st very strong demographic link. Okay, between what kind of vegetables people are willing to accept. <laughs> The younger generation will accept anything, basically, whether it's hydroponics, aeroponics, factory food. Okay? The older generation is more conservative, more willing to accept. And these are the people who usually purchase food, unfortunately. Okay? They want to see food grown with soil, in particular, with no pesticides and so on. Huh? So, so all those have to be recognized. And this, again, goes to the complexity of food security, the multiple dimensions, not just the technical, you know, technological, the physical, but also the sociological. It's very key, yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's a different setting for different um, uh, different uh, regions or different areas. Now, Shaolin, um, there's a question uh, which is very related to what you do. Is vertical or urban farming, or even what you do in the urban setting, even if it's not vertical farming, is that financially viable, bearing in mind cost of land and infrastructure? Not that I know of yet. <laughs> that's why, I mean, that's why people always ask us whether we produce vegetables, but actually Eat Shoots and Roots doesn't produce vegetables. We are not commercial farmers. Mm. We are more of a service provider to um, urban homes to get them to grow their own veggies. And we have explored before, we were like, okay, maybe we should go into commercial farming, but the numbers just couldn't add up for us. Uh, maybe in the time of COVID-19, when there is... Um, huge unemployment, then maybe things will shift a bit, then the value of vegetables will change also, or the value of local vegetables will change. Um, in according, also, in addition to your earlier question about different climates and growing different things, um, obviously in KL, our climate is very different from Cameron Highlands. In Cameron Highlands, you can grow um, night well, a bit more Western vegetables lah, in that sense, whereas we are relegated to growing lowland lowland crop types here in KL. So our mission is also to try to change people's perception of these vegetables that are not very expensive. Um, so people don't usually like put them on a the high priority list, but they are actually the easiest to grow in, in KL. So for example, your tapioca, um, your kangkong and things like that. These are very easy things that people can start with um, growing in the city climate lah, here at least. So we try to push for that. Um, we try to make it interesting. We try to make it... Because like um, Prof Ting, you were saying that it's a supply chain, right? Like you can grow and grow and grow, but then if at the end of the supply chain, nobody knows how to cook it or to them it doesn't taste nice, then it's a waste also. So we try to work with restaurants to come up with new recipes also mm -hmm. to highlight these vegetables so that it's not something that's just... Uh, like tapioca is considered quite old-fashioned, right? But I think um, it needs to be upgraded lah, and some new recipes need to come into play. So then it choose a new, new normal. So yeah, Prof? Wait, let me just interject. I think Sean has made a very important point here. You know, there is so much that people and households can do themselves mm -hmm. actually grow their own vegetables. Like here in Singapore, I'm involved in a movement to try and promote what we call localized indigenous vegetables. And these are the vegetables that are much easier to grow. They're more pest resistant and more disease resistant. You didn't mention the few that I was hoping you would mention, you know, the four angle bean, for example, wing bean. Okay? I mean, wing bean is one of the easiest vegetables to grow. And it's also one of the most nutritious. Okay? Uh, and the other is actually the uh, flower. I, I don't know the, uh, the kind of Malay name. The English name is Chinese jade. The botanical name is Telosma cordata. And the Chinese name is Ye Lai Xiang. It's a very fragrant flower. And it's one of the most nutritious vegetables. You eat the flower itself. Okay? You go to Thailand, the wet markets, and you see tons of this for sale. And yet, in cities, we've tended to forget all these now okay, because yeah. the culture is not there anymore. And Kangkong is another good example. Which, you know, there's lots of other so-called localized indigenous vegetables that are totally adapted to the tropical environment. Okay? That lend themselves to actually backyard gardening. I want to introduce another term, which in fact, I was just talking to somebody else who's going to start a new movement here. He calls it micro-urban farming. Okay? He wants to encourage people to grow 
small vertical pots of vegetables in their apartments, in the alleys to their apartments. His demonstrator is very feasible. And he wants to multiply this because he thinks that it's going to be a significant contributor to the supply of vegetables to households. And also to meet the nutrition aspect. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Now, um, uh, too bad uh, Dr. Shaupik is not back yet, so he's still having his meeting with the Minister. Now, we wanted to discuss Malaysian, um, in the Malaysian context, the, the policies and also the, um, now we have got a question on subsidies, but too bad, I don't think we are able to answer that uh, from uh, Malaysia. And we also wanted to discuss the recently established uh, Cabinet uh, Interministerial Committee for to address food security. And because he's not around, we, are, we won't be able to um, raise these um, issues. Now, I want to ask you, um, Dr. Um, uh, Paul Ting, and also Shaolin, if you want to chip in. What uh, Earlier in our discussion, we mentioned that agriculture takes always takes a back seat. In, uh, when it, there are so many other economic drivers and which are more like glamorous and which brings in more money, agriculture takes a back seat. Now, what is the effect of agriculture or food insecurity to the economy. Prof. Uh, thing. <laughs> Again, you can have a whole webinar on this topic. I think, uh, I think to me, the, the short answer is that food insecurity definitely has a dampening effect on the economy. Yeah, dampening means a reducing effect in many, many different ways, you know. Uh, and the first of which is that we know that, you know, without food security, with food insecurity, you can't have economic development. You can't promote your tourism sector and all the other sectors. So, so we all like to say that food is really the existential need that drives everything else. It's so important yeah, on its own, you know. Now, uh, if you look at it again, you know, let's say short term, mid term, long term, I think food insecurity affects your economic development in different ways. And I mentioned this earlier. One aspect that I'm really concerned with, because I'm also in education, is that food insecurity, which leads to nutrition insecurity, Okay, can affect your whole generation of people. Because young people, cognitive development, okay, the brain development and so on is very affected by malnutrition. And the prevalence of malnutrition is very high in the ASEAN region. Okay? In fact, in, in Southeast Asia, you know, latest FAO figures tell us that one in 10 of our citizens suffers from malnutrition. You think about it, you know, your, your younger generation is affected, which means that to the rest of their life, okay, their, their mental development, cognitive development, learning abilities all hampered. Okay? And that's how important it really is. And if you don't have the, the human resources, you can't grow your economy. Okay? So I think to me, that's one of the arguments, I think to put the governments in that you really have to invest to ensure food security. Okay? And it's not just agriculture alone. You know, as I said earlier, okay, if you can find you know, parts of the economy that can grow your household income, Okay. And you can also empower your households to make sure that they eat nutritious food, nutritious food. Okay. And this then enables the younger generation to really benefit from balanced diets, you know, to, to be able to go to school to learn. Yeah. One of my, my good friends who's a leader in Save the Children, you know, I thought made some very, very actually really relevant remarks. You know, he said that in these tough times here, the fastest way to get children back to normalcy is to get back to schools to learn and to have proper diet. That's the fastest way back to normalcy, which is so true. When we see what's happening in some of the other countries, that are really affected by lack of nutrition. Yeah. Okay. Shaolin, I want to ask you, we've got five minutes left. Very quickly, Shaolin, can you tell us what are your plans um, post-pandemic? You're doing something new and, you, um, and anyone who is a pioneer, like you will face a lot of uh, challenges and also you need to create awareness. What are your quick, um, what will you do uh, post-pandemic? So prior to the pandemic, our services were more in go, uh, running workshops, actually educating people and communities on how to set up gardens. We, we worked with um, developers um, who are setting up community gardens in their space and we would work with the community to do that. Um, evidently, because of the COVID situation, then we couldn't run our workshops anymore. Um, so we've actually started doing online workshops instead. We've offered our tutorials online. What's been interesting is that now we can actually empower people from out of state. So previously we were relegated to uh, within 10 kilometers of our office space or within Klang Valley. But we've been getting uh, requests 
for people to, uh, people have asked us to teach them how to grow in their own spaces from out of state. So I think that's quite encouraging. People are just trying to take it, onto, take it into their own hands to be able to grow something. Um, and an interesting development is that our online shop, like I mentioned before, is seeing a lot of growth. Um, people are looking for supplies and you will be surprised how many people are very noob at gardening and people really or urban folks really have no idea about very simple things. So when we were sending out our kits, which had soil, seeds and fertilizer, um, everyone was really asking us for step by step directions and there were so many basic questions that we thought people would know but they really don't. So. I think our task at hand right now is trying to make um, growing food something that people can understand and something people can experiment with and grow their journey towards agriculture and build that appreciation for agriculture. Yeah, so you know, in other words, agriculture or growing food, just as simple, as simple as growing food is supposed to be a basic living skills. So we only have at least like, uh, three minutes. Now, um, I would like to tell some uh, some questions here. I think we did not uh, respond to, but what we will do is we will give feedback to you with written responses from our panelists, and we'll post your questions and answers on Science Media Center website. That is www.sciencemediacentermalaysia.com. Now, um, before wrapping up, I just want to give you an introduction again on Science Media Center. We have got a website and we also have Facebook Science Media, uh, Media Center Malaysia and um, UPM is the Agriculture University. Now it's renamed as Putra University, uh, University Putra Malaysia. So I would like to thank Putra University Malaysia for hosting and also for organizing this webinar together. Now before we end, I want to um, go back again to the panelists and Shaolin, starting from you. Um, what would you, how would you wrap this up, food security, urban farming, and also if you can give us just uh, three enablers that will support what you're doing. Three enablers, what's an enabler? <laughs> um, what, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, you can say again. <laughs> okay, three enablers, so what would support what you are doing? Like, is it policies, like if it's access to grants, was not really smooth sailing, so what will support a uh, urban farming yeah so like i mentioned before i think making it part of the main syllabus in schools from young up till secondary school age that would be really really helpful um besides that i guess if there were more grants to enable younger farmers to go into farming also if they could control maybe the prices of produce to make it to make elevated actually so there is not so little so that more people will be attracted to growing um, and be able to make a good living out of it, not just uh, something that is considered these days, you know, very, very simple and um, not very, not a very high income driving. Because I mean, if you're, going to in, if you're going to compete with all those people who are producing microchips and computer parts, it has to be raised up as well. And I think government has to step in to do this controlled pricing stuff. Okay, thank you. Now, um, probably have to wait just for a few seconds. Can we launch the final uh, poll, please? We have lost some people, but can we have the final poll quickly? Yes. So apart from COVID-19, what are the other potential food crises you're concerned with? Prof, while they are responding to this uh, poll, maybe um, your question will be the same as well. You can start um, structuring your response. What are the enablers you think should be in place um, to ensure food security? And also, if you can wrap up your perception again and what should be uh, what should be done? Sure. So we have well, got think... sorry, we have got climate change um, as mm -hmm. the highest as the next crisis, or maybe it's a continuous crisis, then we have got natural disaster. So thank you very much mm. for the poll. Yes, Prof, go ahead. Okay, very quickly, I think the three sets of enablers, I think the first is policy. You know, we need the right directions from the top. Okay, without the supportive policy environment, almost nothing happens in every country. The second is, is a kind of a basket of knowledge, technology, and also farming systems, okay, that are practical, yeah. This could be urban, it could be rural, whatever it is, yeah? 
And by practical, I mean they also give livelihoods. Okay, so that's the second enabler. The third, in fact, I think is investments. We just can't rely on government. Okay? We also need private sector investment. Okay? People who are willing to put their money and recognize that food security is so important, growing food is so important. We're actually starting to see that now. But then, as FAO says, you know, we need about $265 billion a year between now and 2050 to assure that we grow enough food for the whole world. That's how big an investment it is. Now, just to wrap up, you know, I think that, as you said earlier, you know, I think COVID-19 is not going to be the only food security disruptor that we will experience in our lifetimes. There's going to be many others. And countries need to be prepared okay, to ensure their food continuity, okay, supply chain continuity, put in different kinds of plans, you know. Second, I think just to close out, I think I think it's important too for governments and households to avoid panic responses. So this happens at the national level, at the household level, because panic responses just lead, you know, to vicious circle, okay, hoarding and this and that, you know, and you actually precipitate shortages. Yeah, so I would actually leave, you know, our, our colleagues here with these two messages, really. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. So I think this should be the new normals. We are all talking about new normals and this should be the new normals. And Shaolin said that uh, this should be like a living uh, skills, um, at least growing some things, especially what's easy to grow, that we could grow at home. Uh, definitely not um, easy to change your mindset, but I, we really hope that people will have a different uh, mindset now on food security. It's not just about having enough food, making food available, but that's what the poll shows. All the other components are very important for food security, which is availability, safety, accessibility, affordability. And um, what is the other one? Availability, accessibility, affordability, affordability. safety. Yeah. So these are all very important. So join us in our future webinars. We will continue to SMC, Science Media Center, will continue to organize webinars on issues related to um, science and technology, and also importantly, current pandemic. Join us in our uh, future webinars, and thank you very much. Thank you to all the panelists for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.